Hello and welcome to a special edition of the Pure Football Podcast. And I say special because I feel absolutely privileged to um, have the opportunity, and I believe it's the first conversation that he has, with somebody that has had 24 years at Arsenal and has got so many stories to tell us about some of the players that have arrived at Arsenal and then succeeded some somewhere else, but that he was the first one or was part of the department that actually identified their talent and saw them grow. This is to me um, a luxury to uh, to have in the Pure Football Podcast, Francis Cajijao. Francis, how are you? You are part of a department, but you've got stories that relate are related to you and uh, to how you identify talent. And I want to know, uh, and we get into the how you do that. How is it that you identify talent? But first of all, uh, you just uh, left Arsenal after 24 years. Uh, I imagine it has been a bit of a, a bit of a shock. But how do you see the future? What do you see in front of you right now? Well, uh, obviously the the, the inks. Just dried, um, so to speak. So, um, so the first thing I, I I've wanted to do is take a, a short break because after 24 years um, working non-stop in a scouting and recruitment department, um, you know, I think it's uh, it's very important not to uh, immediately immediately jump back into the deep end. You know, you need to take some time to reflect, um, and you need to take some time to. Um, to rest and uh, to do some things which you know probably haven't been able to do in the past and uh, and spend a little bit more time with the family um, but after that i i'm i'm very very open in terms of uh, looking forward um, and i don't want to box myself in uh, to one thing or another so um, you know i'm quite happy to um, to to see what what uh, opportunities there are out there and uh, and and Look and analyze at them when they when they uh, take a little bit of form. You're one of the most famous scouts, head of a scout. I don't really know how you want uh, me to uh, me to call you to describe you. Uh, the man with the special eye. I like that one. <laughs> now, what what would be the what would be the, uh, the the role you'll identify or then the title you'll identify more with? I think uh, titles are changing. Um, you know. Um, before you people used to speak about scouts, uh, you know. Now people talk more about recruitment and analysis. Um, I think you know, at the heart of it, basically, I'm an ex footballer and a football coach who has evolved into a into a scout. Uh, it's not necessarily something that I um, that I was predestined to do, or that I had that I had a you know a significant. That there wasn't any real focus in my life earlier in my life to to do what I'm doing now. It's something that evolves. It's something that happens, you know, and, um, and really, you know, I suppose um, the fact that uh, I, I, I had been a player and had been a coach uh, did prepare me specifically for this job. So to tell you the truth, like I said at the start, I don't want to box myself in. So, I, I, you know, I'll leave it for others to, to determine um, what, what the titles are. Uh, obviously, I know what I'm best at but um, but titles is something that's uh, continuously um, changing in this world we work in. It's weird talking to you, right? Because uh, you and I speak in Spanish, but then when you speak in English, obviously you speak in perfect English. And you are son of immigrants, but you were born in England. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how how rich it is to actually have that background. Yeah, I mean... Um, I could very I can say that I was son of a first generation immigrants. Uh, my parents are from Galicia in uh, northern Spain, uh, from the from the city of La Coruña, um, the city that gave us Deportivo La Coruña or Super Depor as it was called for for in those uh, glorious years that they spent in Europe, um, and they arrived in London in well in the UK in 1964. Um, under what was called at the time, funnily enough, the Alien Act of 1964, which, um, which allowed immigrants uh, into the country to work, uh, but not to bring their children with them. 
So, um, yeah, my, my, my parents had a tough time, had a very, very tough time in those years, as you can imagine, 1964, arriving in a, in a foreign country, not speaking the language. Um, but, yeah, I was born in London in 1969 in Paddington at St Mary's Hospital. Um, and basically, I grew up in southwest London and south London um, on council estates, uh, like many, many, many others. Um, I think in the, in the, in around the mid 1980s, there was something like 100,000 Spanish immigrants in the UK, you know? Um, so, you know, obviously everybody's got their story, but, um, yeah, it's quite relevant to things that are happening now. Um, and, uh, a lot of things that, that, that you know, I think those years, the seventies and the eighties, you know, um, especially the, the, the first generation immigrants, um, had it tough. doesn't matter where they were from. Um, I think, uh, things have got obviously a lot better, but obviously we still see things that have to, uh, have to improve in society. I'm, I'm saying it's a, it's a rich experience. I am, I'm, I am an immigrant myself. I came to England when I was 23 and then I've, I don't know where I'm from really. I mean, I'm from here and from there and from everywhere, but that also means that whenever you go out, out there, you just um, feel comfortable. I think that's, that's the, the, the best yeah, way to describe it. I would have to it. agree with you. Yeah, um, I mean, I consider myself a Londoner, but I also consider myself uh, Spanish and I also consider myself Galician. So, um, you know, people say to me, oh, uh, you're Spanish. You say, yeah, what part of Spain are you from? I say London, you know, <laughs> they, don't, they don't quite True. get it at first. But, um, but that's, how I've, that's how I feel, that's, that's what I am. And yeah, I mean, it's uh, obviously it's got a lot of uh, advantages, you know, the fact that you speak different languages. Um, in this case, you know, obviously uh, fluent English, Spanish and Portuguese, uh, seeing as Galicia has its own language, which is very similar to Portuguese. Uh, and then obviously whatever you pick up at school. So, um, so the fact that you're from um, a, a family, an immigrant family, and the fact that you've, you're brought up, brought up in this multicultural way um, I think it's got a lot, a lot of advantages, you know, that you can then take on uh, in your life and in your profession. Starting by the fact that from the beginning, when you get born, you know the world is very big. So you, and, and I guess there is that urge to try to explore it as well. Did you, did you feel like that as a young man? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it, yeah, cer certainly it helps you not to have a narrow outlook on life. Um, which I think is absolutely vital. Um, and I think that anything that, that narrows your outlook on life is a negative factor. So, um, so I would say that, yes, that's very, very important, you know, coming from a family who were prepared, you know, to give everything up, the very little that they had, but um, to go to travel uh, somewhere where they didn't know anybody, where they didn't know the language, um, you know, the bravery it took to do that. So, you know, as, as second generation uh, immigrants or as sons of immigrants, um, uh, you know, you, you feel you have a duty then to, uh, to, to pay back that bravery um, to, your, to your parents and, uh, and so many others like them. So, yeah, I think, I think it's, it sets you in very, very good stead for, for anything you want to do from then on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. You were also a good player. And I know you, you're going to say you weren't, but uh, you want things. I never want anything in my life. Well, actually, I won the school, the, the school uh, for two years. We won the school league. That's it. But you won an FA Cup. FA you Youth Cup. Play. FA Youth still, Cup. Still. Um, yeah, I think I, um, I, I, I don't think I was a bad player. I think I was a, a half decent um, player and you know I started my career at Arsenal I, you know I, I got signed by Barcelona and uh, but but then you could probably say I had a mediocre career that. after that you cannot jump from you cannot jump from I played for Arsenal and then went to Barcelona we have to stop there <laughs> but first what were you what what position did you play I started off my career uh, I mean when I was playing in schools football and youth football and in leagues in Sunday leagues uh, for my dad's team and um and uh, in South London youth leagues, I, I, I played a combination of positions. Yeah, I, but predominantly, I was a midfielder, um, an attacking midfielder, an attacking creative midfielder. 
Um, but I mean, I'd also played as a as a uh, striker and I'd played as a as a centre back. Um, then when I moved to Arsenal, the, um, it was very clear that they were going to use me as a as a striker. So I played up front in a, basically in a traditional four four two four four one one um in that youth team with uh, Kevin Campbell who played ahead of me and I played just just off him in the, in the hole uh so you could say we we played a, a combination we we were a striker second striker tandem um then after that I played in a variety of positions and I went all the way from striker to center back again so um you know I I I think I played in about five positions um including goalkeeper in the Spanish second division after our goalkeeper was sent off <laughs> so i did 10 minutes against mallorca as a as a goalkeeper in uh, when i was when i was 19 so you you really are one of the pioneers that uh, from an english club you went to spain and signed spanish players and went to see them and went to see them a lot of times that didn't happen so how the hell were you signed from from for barcelona i mean those things weren't happening at the time well um You know, the, 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 the story basically is Barcelona and Real Madrid at the time had, um, had, uh, had the information that there was a Spanish player or a son of Spanish parents playing at Arsenal. Um, and they, the information they had was that they told me afterwards that I was close to, uh, to signing a, or being offered a professional contract at Arsenal. And uh, they started to follow me in the, in the FA Youth Cup matches in uh, 1988. So, um, so they watched me apparently in four or five games, both clubs. And then I had an offer both from Madrid and Barcelona at the time. Um, I chose Barcelona um, for various reasons. Um, I probably should have stayed at Arsenal uh, at the time. I think, um, you know, I, I, I think I was in a good place. Um, And I think it probably uh, overwhelmed me and overawed me a little bit, you know, arriving at such a big club. And, and it wasn't the Barcelona of today, uh, where everything is so super controlled. Um, well, today, of late. Um, but, but certainly it was Barcelona which had gone through the uh, convulsive period with Luis Aragonés and a strike with the players and the arrival of Johan Cruyff as manager. Uh, it wasn't an easy place for an 18-year-old to arrive um, and especially an 18 year old who had to have an immediate pelvic uh, operation. So um, it was, a, it was a, um, probably a frightening period uh, for an 18 year old, you know, arriving by himself um, at such a huge club uh, and with a little bit of weight on the shoulders, you know. But that's again, sets you instead for the future. Not necessarily for that precise moment, but for the future. So, in fact, uh, you, you moved on uh, to other Spanish clubs. Tell us a little bit how, how that went. Yeah, I played at, uh, first at uh, Barcelona B, uh, Barcelona B in the second division. I moved on loan to Racing Santander. Uh, unfortunately, another operation at Racing Santander, um, where I broke my metatarsal. And um, that didn't really go very well. Um, then I went back to South End. I actually joined for a sh very short period Wimbledon um, when Ray Harford was manager there. Um, I don't, we saw it wasn't going to be the right fit. And then I went to South End, and uh, again, I think uh, I, I, I don't think I made the right decision. You know, I remember uh, Kevin Richardson, an ex Arsenal and Everton player um, at the time, he, uh, he wanted to take me down to Everton because under Howard Kendall as manager, And, um, and I think it would have been a far better fit for the type of player I was. But again, it was, they're, they're all experiences. Uh, I think, you know, do you learn more from the positive or from the negative experiences in life? I would, I would now say that you, you learn more from the negative experiences in life. They're the ones that set you up, um, you know, and you have to, be, um, you have, to have, have drive and focus to get through those negative moments. Um, I did that. I went back to Spain. I played at Latin de Ferrol um, for a season. That went very well. Then I went to, uh, I played in the second division B, which would be the, the, the equivalent of, at the time, the English third division or now division one. 
um, for Yeclano, um, and then ended, ended my career at Club Lemos, a third division club where uh, eventually after ankle operation I, I had to retire. Um, I was already the youth team coach at that club um, and scouting part-time for Arsenal at the time already um, in Spain and Portugal. Um, I then became the first team manager and technical director at that club, but continued my link with, with Arsenal in a part-time capacity. Those nearly misses that you're talking about, almost to Everton, you know, I was in Barcelona B, uh, I should have stayed at Arsenal. Do you think that that counted for the decision to continue in football? Uh, or was it a passion uh, so big that no matter what, you would always have been? Do you, do you feel that those near misses had an influence? Um, yeah, well, if I look back, and I'm not one really to look back too much, but if I look back, um, I would say that I had the potential to be a far greater player. Um, you know, if I, if I didn't realise that potential, it was for one reason or for another, and, and a part of it is, is because I, I would have had myself to blame as well. Um, you know, I think in the end, I had a mediocre professional career. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I was privileged to have a, a career as a professional footballer. You know, I represented my country. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, looking back and reflecting, um, I think what I have done is I've taken some of those negatives or as you might say, near misses um, or opportunities um, missed. And I've, I've been able to take them on to the, to the next level, whether it was initially coaching and then scouting and recruitment. Um, and I've been able to take on a lot of those experiences that I've had in my life um, and make them work for me later on in my life, you know. So how did the opportunity to scout for Arsenal come about? We were already hearing that uh, you were coaching and already scouting for them. Yeah, I, I, um, I was taking my, um, my uh, coaching license at the FA. Um, I was, at, at the time, I was taking my UEFA B license <clears throat> and I'd, um, no, sorry, I was, I was halfway through my, my uh, A license. Uh, I just got back from Loughborough University and part of it was um, coaching education um, at a football club. So via uh, the late, great Don Howe and, um, and uh, Pat Rice, uh, I was able to spend a week at Arsenal um, watching coaching. Um, helping with uh, with the youth coaching and the under sixteen coaching as well, and uh, this developed into uh, at the time I was I was a, a manager a first team coach in the Spanish third division. I was the youngest coach in the Spanish third division at the time at twenty nine years of age, and um, it developed into a meeting between Pat Rice, who was assistant manager, Steve Rowley, chief scout at the time, and Arsene, and uh, they explained me the vision that they had for a global scouting department and um and my i think myself and damien Camoli were two of the first additions to that uh global scouting department um which which was started back then initially i did it on a part-time basis because i wanted to coach and continue coaching and I, i had a contract and i was lucky that that there was an agreement between arsenal and that and my club so that i could do both things um, which was an incredible experience, you know, and, and if I didn't really have time these last few years to do anything, imagine then, you know, coaching, being a technical director, still running the academy and working for Arsenal as a scout in Spain and Portugal. I mean, crazy times, um, but certainly a great education and great experience. Um, and, uh, and we just took it from there. And after uh, three, two and a half years, I was asked to go full time uh by Arsene and uh and Steve and and I did that somebody uh, like Dick Lowe former transfer fixer of, of Arsenal uh came up with a with a line and we're jumping uh your story a little bit here but you'll understand why he says that um the world of scouting has tons of people who will qualify their opinion they'll say this is a great player but I'm with Franny as he calls you uh, it's this player is rubbish or this player is good and he stands by his opinion now uh, it's perhaps uh, an extreme way of explaining 
eventually what you became. But the process to go from getting to see players to actually have that uh, easy way to identify what's good and what's bad. How'd you get there? How'd you get from one to the other? Yeah, I mean, I will say, you know, I think it was Richard Law that said that. Um, I think it's a little bit uh, simplified, simplified. You know, I wouldn't think that the, the term rubbish is, is something I would be um, using on a, on a, on, on, on a day-to-day basis. But um, certainly I would say that, you know, everything that you've done in your career or in your, in, in your life leads you, that path leads you somewhere. Um, and you have to draw on all those experiences. So I think, um, you know, from being a player, my, my, my dad was a goalkeeper in the Spanish third division and had started his career at Deportivo La Coruña. My, my brother was a goalkeeper, played non-league and in the Ishmian League in England. Um, so we were, we were a football family, you know. Uh, football, it was religion in my household. You know, it always was. Um, so... Um, you know that that's that's the origins. And then you're playing your playing career, your coaching uh, career, and, and your qualifications that you take. I think that all sets you instead for the future. And then, obviously, the experience that you draw on in your initial stages. And so when I became a scout, you know, one thing is to become a scout uh, and start your career in scouting, and another thing is to do it under somebody like Arsene Wenger. You know, somebody of that vision. Uh, somebody who, I mean, if, if any manager over the last, well, I would say two, but I would say there are two managers who clearly shown in the past that not only were they managers that had great vision for the future and who had took a, a real detailed interest in scouting and recruitment were Arsene Wenger and Alex Ferguson. Um, so I was, you know, very, very lucky to work for and with one of those people. Um, so that gave me a huge scope um, and I was able to uh, learn along the way like everybody does. Um, you pick things up um, and then you know, your, your football eye turns into a trained eye and your trained eye turns into an experienced trained eye. You know? um, and obviously along the way you have, to, um, you have to cope and you have to adapt to, um, to different ways of working, you know, to different resources and technology. Um, so it's, it, it's a journey, you know, it's, it's a journey. You, you, I don't think you set off and you say, look, you know, like, like I, I said to you at the start, um, you know, somebody had said to me 30 years ago, you're gonna work as a, in scouting, in recruitment, you know, in, um, in player identification. Um, and you're going to be 24 years at Arsenal doing so, you know, I would have told you you're crazy. Um, but, you know, it, as I say, it's a path and it's a journey and, uh, and there's a start and an end. And, uh, um, you know, my, my beginning at the club, uh, my, my start at the club was, was um, I think I was very privileged to do it with some really fantastic people and support staff around me. When you go on... Uh to look at one particular player. Is there anything you look at first? Well, you know, again, I, 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 I draw back to experiences from the start. Um, and, um, and both Arsene and, and Steve Rowley, who worked for many, many years at Chief, as Chief Scout at Arsenal and did an absolutely incredible job. Um, you know, um, it was very clear, very evident that we did look for a prototype of player for Arsenal. You know, you, you can say uh, there are good players, there are fantastic players, but they're not necessarily your club's prototype. So I think you have to look very, very much at the prototype of player that you want to bring to your club. You know, what is the philosophy of your football club? What is the culture of your football club? Once that's identified, and under Arsene it was very, very... Um, identifiable then from there you, you you set your stall and you look at the players that fit that particular culture that way of playing that playing style uh, I think we did that and I think it was very important uh, player intelligence um, players who could adapt to um, to a high 
technical performance, um, you know, to a very expansive way of playing the game, which is what um, what Arsene wanted in in those, in, especially in those early years. Uh, that's not to say that all the other factors that you look at, uh, you know, that the physical, the the strength, the power, the pace, the um, you know, and the, and the mentality, of course, which more and more in the game becomes the defining factor for an elite player. But you mentioned already intelligence. Uh, I, I, that's, I feel, the kind of... Um, I know that we've moved to a world where stats are very important uh, and uh, it's part of the decision-making. But how do you calculate intelligence? Uh, I, I'm not sure. And I, that's something that the eye perhaps can identify better than the stats, maybe? Yeah, I would agree with you. I think, I think everything's important nowadays. I think you have to use all the resources that you have. You know, so, of course... At an elite football club, you're going to have a lot of resources. You, you know, you're going to have an analytics department. You're going to have big data. Uh, so you've got your stats. But of course, everything starts. Everything starts with identification. Um, you know, and especially if they're younger players and development players, where there is no, not, not so much scope for data on these players. So it starts with a trained eye. Um, and yeah, I've always said that, that you know, it's, it's very, very, very important uh, to look at players' decision-making, you know, from an early age. Um, not to say that, you know, their decision-making doesn't improve over their careers, because it, it does with good coaching, um, with analysis. They're, they're, you know, the, the players with experience, especially, uh, players will improve their decision-making. But it's very important to see uh, young players and development stage players um, you know, that, that combination of intelligence and intuition. Um, and I think that's, that, that calls in, in many occasions for fine detail and fine eye. Um, what they do off the ball, um, you know, what, what, what positions they take up. You know, some of them, that they do so uh, in a very innate fashion uh, and a very untrained and natural fashion. I think I said in, the, in, in a Congress at Spanish FA years ago that, um, that it was very, very, let's use the word refreshing, to see that the, 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 the top player in world football at the time was, uh, was Zinedine Zidane, in my opinion. Um, and at least for, a, for, you know, for, a, for two, three, four years, you, you could have considered him you know, the best player of his generation. Um, and it was very refreshing to see a player like him uh, at the very, very top, because it was very evident that he wasn't the quickest, he wasn't the strongest, he wasn't the most powerful. You could probably say 1v1, he wasn't a particularly or exceptional, uh, skillful player in, in, in a 1v1. Yet he was, of course, a technically very gifted player. But above all, he was uh, a sublime combination of intelligence and intuition, you know. Uh, linked, of course, to determination and mental attributes. But it was fantastic to see that, um, especially in a time when, when, when the physicality of football was becoming, to become, was becoming ever mo more important to see somebody like Zidane, you know, uh, who based his game on intelligence and, and, and intuition, um, I think was, was very, very, very important. When you talk about intu intuition and intelligence, are you referring intelligence is what uh, is decision making and intuition is what he does when there is hardly no time to react? Or yes, I would I would say intuition is 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 you know enabling players who are, who, who who do things um, without without any thought process. Of course, you could say that that thought process has been very trained, and and that's another discussion, and we, we'd be here all day, but. Um, but yes, it, to be able to see players who can combine that decision making, that intelligence, that GPS that they have there in their brain um, with uh, spontaneous moments where they react to situations without any thought process. I think that's, um, you know, that combination is, is very much nowadays something that's linked to elite level footballers. I guess the, the, the perfect um, department, uh, scouting department now is one that mixes, as you say, the eye and, and the data. Uh, I, I don't know if we're going too much towards the data for your liking or we've abandoned some of the uh, intuition that the uh, scouts have. 
uh, what's, what's the situation now? I think it's something we have to live with. I think it's something we have to live with. I don't think it's exclusive to football. I don't think it's exclusive to sport. Um, I think, you know, it's something we have to live with in, in life in general. I think, uh, you know, this, the situation, this coronavirus and COVID situation has shown us, you know, um, uh, that obviously stats, numbers, uh, data is very important. Uh, could, could it be that there is an excess and that it's confusing? Possibly. But I think um, each club has to tailor their, their resources and each club has to know before we were talking about club identification, about club culture. Uh, and I think that you have to tailor those resources, you know, so you have to have the trained eye. You have to have that player identification uh, department, which is absolutely essential. Um, but you need data, you know, you need data, you need uh, and player analysis, you need, uh, you know, physical analysis, you need profiling. Um, Obviously, you, you need to work with databases and, and recruitment platforms. So this all becomes part of an elite level um, operation uh, in football. But it starts, in my opinion, with, with, um, with a trained eye and with player identification, you know, because um, I think that's the basis. That's the basis. After that, you know, and I'm, I'm, once a player gets to a certain level, it's very easy to compile information and to have information and to have data on this player. But when they're at a younger level and when they're at development level, you know, those players that go from, in a very short space of time nowadays, from, from uh, players who are, you, you're able to sign maybe for nothing or for next to nothing for compensation and end up being, you know, 100 million pound players. I think um, that player, that starts with player identification. So uh, I think it's very important to remember this. Um, but yes, uh, every resource helps and if it's tailor-made for your club and to the resources and to the needs of your club, well then that's ideal. I tell you a classic uh, player identification. I'm writing a book on Maradona and the coach uh, that he had at the first Where did he uh, play? Well, I think the stats will tell you that he's a very, very good player. But before that, for the identification bit, uh, Francis Cornejo, his coach at uh, the Argentina Juniors, and the nine must have been at the time, he trialed him and he said before he even kicked a ball, the way he placed himself in the team to be able to see what was happening in front of him, two instructions that he gave, this is an eight-year-old giving instructions, by the way, <laughs> to, to his teammates. And he thought like, what's going on here? So already the head is turning towards that before he even touches a ball. That's the kind of thing that it's, I'm not sure you can put data on that, on those little details. But data confirms and perhaps even gives you more uh, reasons to, to follow that first instinct and that first... Yeah, I mean, obviously, in, 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 in terms of the player or the type of player you just mentioned, you know, that, 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 that intelligence, that football intelligence, that uh, instinct, that intuition, you know, that, those are innate qualities. Uh, links to that absolute talent that he was born with, that he was obviously born with. Um, but then, of course, the, the, I think the data and the analysis kicks in a lot further on, you know, a lot further down the, down the line. Um, you know, and, and, and yes, but you, you need to remember also that data needs to be interpreted. Numbers need to be interpreted because otherwise they're, num they're just numbers. I think, of course, now we have very advanced uh, ways um, to work with data and to work with stats but um, um, I think you still need to be able to interpret and you still need to be able to translate that data and translate that to um, to the technical aspects of the game you know which are the fundamentals um, so, so I think that it's a very, nece very necessary tool I, I do think to, to a point that Everything is subjective. Everything is subjective. It's man-made, you know, and, and okay, we're working with, with, with numbers and with computers and algorithms. And, but it, it's, in the end, it's, it's people that interpret the, these numbers. So um, there is, a, there is a, an aspect of subjectivity to everything we do, to everything we do in life. Um, and this is no different. Did you ever have uh, that kind of uh, feeling towards a player when you saw him just by standing up or the way he walked towards the ball and before he even kicked the ball, 
you thought there's something special here. Ever, ever, ever came across anything? Yes, yes. Um, that, that, you know, I think it was Arsene that used to call it that smell. That smell for the game, that smell for a player, that smell for, for something special. Um, I think, yes. Uh, of course, then afterwards you have to uh, quantify it and you have to, um, you know, measure it. Um, but yes, there are certain players uh, that just in the warm-up, you know, especially if you're watching, let's say, a, a youth game um, or players... Tell me names. Are... Tell, me, tell me some players that you identified quickly. You thought, oh, wow. It's well, you would, say, you, you would say very quickly that, um, that, that um, somebody like Cesc Fabregas or uh, for, 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 for his intelligence, for his awareness... Uh, for you know, for his um, football brain, um, it wasn't it wasn't something you would often see in a fifteen, sixteen year old. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, I, I, and for different reasons, somebody like Martinelli afterwards, who you know, for, for different reasons to those completely different players, but you do see or you do sense that there is something special in the makeup um, of those players. You know. Um, You know, I remember when we were scouting players like um, when Steve Rowley himself was scouting players like Robin Van Persie as well. Um, you, you know, wasn't in the first team but, uh, and had some issues. But you would see something special. You would see something there. Uh, some, sometimes you couldn't fully quantify it or classify it, but you knew there was something special there, you know. And, and, and those are the players that you take a gamble on. You know, those are the players that you take a gamble on. Who was the first player that uh, Arsenal signed because of you? Well, I would say that signed is, you know, football clubs sign players, um, you know, scouts, scouting departments, uh, recruitment departments are there to recommend players. Um, and, and obviously there is a lot of process and a lot of people involved in the signing uh, of, and, in the, and the registration of a football player from one club to another. Um, but yes, going back to, 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 to player ID and, and I could say that the first recommendation, first player we signed as it's of public knowledge is, uh, was Lauren, who, um, who was playing at Mallorca um, at the time, they second division and uh, they, they then obviously went up to the first division and uh, he was playing there as a right winger. Um, so that would have been... Uh, more or less the first real recommendation. Um, so, and I recommended him as a right back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did he know that you actually recommended him for something that he wasn't playing in? The player knows, because obviously I told him the story afterwards. But um, yeah, it, at the time we were looking for, for a right back. I think it was, um, I think we had Lee Dixon and Oleg Luzny. Um, Lee Dixon, you know, uh, I think it was in the last year of his contract and, and um, Arsene wanted a, another right back. So, you know, we recommended uh, Lauren and, uh, and I, you know, I, I, I felt very strongly that with, his, with the qualities he had, that he wouldn't be a winger or a central midfielder as he'd played uh, earlier in his career uh, in Spain and that he would make a great right back. Um, you know, there was a little bit of tension at the beginning. Uh, you know, there was, a, there was there was a little bit of disagree. There was a few disagreements, but I think we saw afterwards that, that Lauren had a, an absolutely outstanding career um, and was a you know probably one of the best right backs in probably in Arsenal's history. You know, uh, part of that invincible team and a very very competitive and competent player. Mm -hmm. I wrote in my uh, Messi biography that, uh, and I actually mentioned you because uh, as part of that pioneering world that you were doing um, you approached Cesc, Fabregas, Piquet and Messi the three of them were in the same cadete team that's under 15 or so on this 15-16 and well I tell the story that I learned at the time what happened but I'll let you um, if you can give us more detail of what happened because one of the three signed But another one actually came to London and there was another one who thought, maybe, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, obviously, for, 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 you know, for the confidentiality reasons, I can't really go uh, in depth 
Um, although, well, I think you know, Arsene, uh, Arsene stated on our on our website whilst he was manager that um, that yes, we were close at one stage to signing uh, Messi. I mean, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying we were close, but um, we were there and thereabouts and discussions took place with his representatives. Um, he had a, 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 an issue of a work permit, um, which at the time wasn't even clear in Spain where he was. So, um, so that was discarded. And yes, it, it's, it's public domain and public knowledge that Gerard Piquet uh, was, you know, came inches away from... Um, from signing a contract for us uh, and uh, and joining us and joined Manchester United six months later. Yeah, BK came to London, didn't he? And uh, he was impressed by Arsene Wenger. I imagine you were hosting him and leading him and showing him around. But uh, why didn't he sign at the time then? Because Cesc and him are very close. And there was a, there was, uh, the, the, uh, you know, really the only thing I can say, as I say, there's confidentiality uh, there and, and, and I'm, I'm bound to that uh, ethically. Um, but um, th- th- there was some disagreement, uh, contractual disagreement um, oh. between the club and, um, and Gerard's representatives uh, at the time. Um, and it didn't go forward because of those contractual disagreements. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cesc Fabregas, uh, it was a game in which both Martinelli and Hector Bellerin scored, and on Twitter he said, Francis Cajijaus tries again, that's what Martinelli uh, scored his goal, and then when uh, Hector Bellerin did so, and Francis Cajijaus tries again and again, legend. Uh, he obviously has all very been very, very open, thanking you many times for not only approaching him and convincing him to come to Arsenal, I think there's more that the, the, he felt looked after at a time when, as you describe yourself, when you left London to go to Barcelona, you were 18. He was 16 when he came to London. And I'm sure you had a hand in helping him settle. Yeah, I think that, the, you know, the, at the time it was a big thing. You know, I, I, I can't remember any other case of, uh, in, at the time, you know, of course, of, of, a, of, a, of such a young player joining us from such a big club. Um, you know, and I think um, he was playing in their in their under sixteens there. You know, um, in what was the best under sixteen side I'd ever seen, and still to this day. Um, but it was it was you know he had to he came to to London with, by himself, uh, without his parents. You know, the club put him into digs um, with a wonderful woman, uh, Noreen, and um, wonderful woman and wonderful family, and. Um, and, and of course, that's, those are very, very difficult times. And I drew a little bit on my experiences, when, even though I was a year, a year and a half, nearly two years older. I, I drew on my experiences when I'd done it the other way around. And, um, and I knew that it was going to be tough. But to, to, to be fair also, um, he was, the way he, he, the maturity he showed was exceptional. Because I, I remember often speaking to him and saying, are you okay? Is everything all right? Is the food okay? Is the weather okay? Um, is the family okay? Is travel? Is the language? And he kept saying to me, "Look, Fran, I came here to play football. I didn't come here to eat in restaurants, and you know, I came here to play football." And you know, when you got a sixteen-year-old who's saying that to you, it tells you everything. It tells you everything, and it's an example to young players. Um, you know, especially in an era where maybe young players don't watch as much football uh, as they used to. Um, I think it's um, it's very important, you know. Um, two 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 of the you know of the best players in in that period or in the period that I've been at the club, two of the, two players that that we recommended and who joined us, Cesc Fabregas and Santi Cazorla, um, their love of the game, how much they watch football, how much football interests them, every aspect of football. Um, I think young players now need to draw a lot on, on, on and look a lot at players like that, you know, because I think it's more and more important with all the distractions that, that young players can have. I think they need to keep their focus on the game more. And certainly players like Cesc Fabregas and Santi Cazorla um, are, are, mm-hmm. are real people that those young people can look at and learn from. 
I'm going to make a list. Uh, well, this list I saw in the, in the mirror, but uh, let's see if it's more or less uh, accurate in terms of uh, players that you've been involved in bringing to, uh, to Arsenal. Lawrence Fabregas, which you mentioned, Santi Cazorl as well, Jose Antonio Reyes, uh, Nacho Monreal, Manuel Munia, Mikel Arteta, Emiliano Martinez, Granit Xhaka, Alexis Sanchez, Carlos Vela, Hector Bellerin, Robbie Van Persie, Gabriel Martinelli, William Saliba. So, you are talking about history, recent history of, of the club, uh, players that have been very important. Uh, and that also means that whatever your opinion was on them was listened, respected, and people take took chances, partly because you said so, yes? Yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, you know, when, when a club signs a football player, there is a lot of people involved. Um, it starts with identification. I was very, very lucky. Uh, I'm privileged to be able to work with people like Arsene Wenger and with Steve Rowley, you know, who, um, who would listen to me, um, you know, um, and, you know, you have more involvement in some of those, you have less involvement, but yes, there was involvement in all of those. Um, I think at the time we had a very, very, very strong scouting department and I think that um, the club made some exceptional uh, signings, especially in terms of young development players, uh, you know, who then went on to have fantastic careers um, and in, in some cases also um, earn a lot of money for, for the club in transfers. Of course, along the way, there's also going to be um, gambles that you make, you know, uh, and players that don't work out. Um, I think this is relevant to every football club, every scouting department in the world. Um, you know, you just have to make sure that those gambles are small gambles, if possible. Um, but yeah, I, I, think, I think, you know, I, I was lucky to work within um, a, a, an absolutely outstanding um, club and with people who really took an interest in not only in uh, scouting and player recruitment, but also in player development, you know, um, and some very, very good coaches, you know, because one part of this is saying, okay, let's recommend a player. The next part is the club to actually, you know, take on board that recommendation and, and try and attain the services of that player. And then the next part, especially if you're talking about young players and development players, is that development phase and you need good coaching uh, and then you need a manager to throw them in at the deep end, you know, and that's something that Arsene Wenger was absolutely exceptional at. Throwing that, having the confidence, being a, a manager who was, you know, fighting for championships, fighting for the league, fighting to win the, 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 the Premier League, fighting to win the Champions League. But at the same time, being able to throw those young players in. Yes, of course, if they, he was throwing them in, it's because they had talent. But then, you know, that takes a very, very, very strong manager uh, to do that. And in a lot of those cases of players that you've mentioned there, you know, if it wasn't also for the bravery of the manager, um, you know, in some of those cases, we might have seen those careers go a different way. Let me ask you about three names and then we're reaching the end of the, of the conversation. But the first one is uh, somebody that, that both of us uh, loved and miss uh, in Jose Antonio Reyes. Uh, who, of course, passed sadly passed away, but I was always shocked, and I, I did ask him this: How did they convince you to come over to London when you are actually Sevilla through and through? And he's that kind of player that was difficult to get out of his normal environment, a difficult environment that he had as a kid as well. How how you must have, you must tell us how you did that. Well, Jose Antonio is a player that we first identified. Um, I think the first time I saw him, he was 16. And, um, you know, I remember thinking there's a hell of a player here. Um, and, you know, we talked about him and um, about the possibility of signing him a lot earlier, you know. Um, and there was that chance. For one reason or for another, um, the club d decided to not take, it, take up on it. So we, we, we actually signed him probably two and a half years after that, uh, or nearly three years, no, two and a half years after that. And, um, 
uh, yeah, it was a very difficult situation. All, all I can remember is, uh, you, you know, the only anecdote I can, I can, I'll tell you is it was probably a heartbreaking situation for, for the boy at the time uh, because he was very much set in, uh, in his roots and in the, in the roots of his area. And in the, his, you know, he was from Utrera, which is, uh, um, you know, the, one of the um, real, real uh, cultural hotbeds of, uh, of, of Sevilla. And, um, and, and uh, the other anecdote is that um, I remember David Dean, Mr. Dean, our chief executive at the time, and myself basically having to run from um, from the stadium, you know, because um, basically we had supporters with uh, with bricks and throwing all sorts at the car, and uh, it was it was it was eventful. It was eventful. Um, it was a. Uh, but as I say, I'll, I'll I'll leave those anecdotes for <laughs> for for fifteen or twenty years. <laughs> maybe uh, maybe there'll be, there'll be in a book somewhere. Second, uh, second name, Santi Cazorla, who it's easy to identify the talent, I would say, but maybe not so easy to actually make, uh, make a career abroad. I, again, somebody that, that perhaps would have feel more comfortable uh, being in Spain, but still, you know, he managed to do so well at Arsenal. What do you remember of his arrival? Santi Cazorla, I mean, let me start by saying that I think he is one of the most talented footballers I've ever seen. Um, you know... You, you, you'd watch Santi Cazorla in training take um, set pieces with his right foot and with his left foot and you'd be thinking, you know, which is his predominant, which is his stronger foot? You know, it's um, absolutely exceptional technical ability, um, great football awareness. We talked about intelligence and, and intuition um, and also, you know, what a positive, fantastic intelligent bright person he is um he is really an an an, an exceptional um figurehead and somebody that young players can can really look to um there was there was doubts about santi in terms of you know a lot of doubts not so much nowadays in the in the in the premier league some of those myths have been put to bed but um certainly in those times there was you know People would say, "Look, he's he's so small, you know. He's he's not the quickest. He's not strong. He's not powerful. He's not, you know." But Santi's got an exceptional football brain. Mm-hmm. Santi's got exceptional technique, you know. Um, Santi is competitive. He's a winner. So um, you know, for me, it was very, very, very clear. Um, and and you know, we we actually we we looked at signing him. Um, earlier, you know, we had obviously, as everybody knows in his public domain, um, we lost or well, we sold Seth Fabregas and uh, Samir Nasri. And, you know, we had the possibility of looking into bringing in Santi then and it was looked into and um, I was a very strong advocate for bringing him in. It didn't happen and, and he, he joined Malaga. But uh, luckily for us, uh, Malaga had financial problems uh, the next season and we were able to... Uh, to bring Santi in and the relationship was already very much developed with Santi and his representatives from years back. You know, people I knew from, from many, many years back. So uh, we were able to bring him in and, you know, and I think Arsene would, would tell you as well that he's, you know, he's one of the best players that he's worked with, you know, and he was very, very, very unlucky to have the injury that he had because, you know, I, I could have seen Santi playing for another four and five years because he doesn't necessarily depend so much on the physicality, uh, you know. So um, it's more up here and uh, uh, exceptional player. A sign that you've all done a really good job with um, having clear the identity of the club and selling that identity to players is that they all want to come back. So Santi Cazorla is thinking, if Mikel Arteta rigs me and says to be an assistant, I would say yes. He loves that idea. They both love each other as well. And, and I think it's, it's, it's to do with the fact that it's Mikel Arteta. It's to do with the fact that he's going back to Arsenal, which is the third person I wanted to mention is what uh, Mikel Arteta has done, of course. Uh, also, you were involved in, in his arrival. What, what, what was it like uh, that, uh, that you saw that he could add and that he added straight away? I knew Mikel since he's a 16, 17-year-old. I you know, followed his career all the way 
from when he started at Antiwoko in, uh, in San Sebastian. Um, so, um, yeah, it's a very, you know, it, it, he was a strong-minded, um, organised, well-balanced central midfielder. And I think those uh, qualities are qualities that he has taken on to, um, to, to, to his, into his coaching and management career now. Uh, which is at an early stage, but I think we can already see that you know he's going to bring a lot to the table, and I think that the uh, experience he had working under Pep Guardiola uh, was absolutely invaluable uh, to him, and he's had a long career and uh, and uh, played in different countries, um, and so obviously he's he's going to have a very um, open football mind, but at the same time strong convictions. I think he'll do exceptionally well as a manager. Mm -hmm. Last name, uh, I'll leave it at the end because it's the big name of your career, Arsene Wenger. Uh, you already given us uh, little insights of what it is to work with him, the freedom he gave you, uh, the, the, that he had identified. He had a vision, identified the, the path and you all followed it. But tell us, tell us more what it was the day-to-day -day working with, with Arsene Wenger. I think, uh, you know, you could, you could say that, you know, he... First and foremost, he was somebody who didn't have time, but made time for everybody. You know, that's, and I think he's um, an exceptional listener. You know, I think it's something I learned is, you know, I, I, I do remember my, my, my parents telling me when I was very young that you have two of these, and just one of these. So um, that's got to be the, uh, the ratio when you speak. You know, you have to listen more and speak less. Um, I think Arsene was a master in, in that aspect. Um, he was able to take in and process so much information um, uh, and then make it practical, make it work for him. Um, I think, you know, apart from the fact that obviously he's, he was an exceptionally successful manager and coach, And, and, and a legend at Arsenal Football Club. I think it's, um, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of sides to Arsene that people didn't, didn't see, you know. Um, his humour, you know, his humour. Um, uh, very witty, uh, you know, very perceptive. And uh, I think, you know, in terms of relating it to what I did and, and, and my work, um, you know, he was somebody who would always listen. He would somebody that would always back your judgment, not all the time, because, you know, as you know, that there are, there are a lot of factors in football and there are finances um, and you can't always um, go with just simply on somebody's judgment. But um, more often than not, he would back your judgment. Uh, so I think he was, uh, he was loyal to his people and, um, and a very, obviously... In, in my case, a very, very, very important person, one of the, the, the very important people uh, that I had a privilege to work with. There is a confidentiality agreement in the contract that I suppose it, it stops you talking about cert certain things. It's the standard uh, procedure from clubs when, when they let somebody go. But, but I still got the, um, you know, I, I hear you, I see where you've been and what you've done for the club. And I just wonder, why are you not staying on? That's not really a question that I can answer. So, you know, I think that's a, a question for somebody else. Right. That is, is there, what feeling you've got right now about that? Is it, is it, is it hurt? Is it disappointment? Is it uh, the excitement of a new plan ahead or what is it? Yeah, I think, you know, I think you, you can't afford to be bitter in life. Um, and I think, you know, you have to have a thick skin and you have to get over things quickly. Um, I'm very, very, very proud of the time I spent and I'm proud of, of, of my personal, my personal achievements. Um, but I'm, I also feel very, very privileged uh, to have worked for Arsenal Football Club, a club that gave me so lot, a club where I was able to learn and where I was able to progress in my career. Um, and I met some and worked with some incredible people over the years. Um, so in that aspect, uh, I feel privileged. You know, Arsenal's an institution. Um, you know, we're not talking about, not so much talking about people, we're talking about the institution. And, uh, and I feel privileged to have spent 
as you well said, basically half my life uh, with this institution and started my career there as well. But um, everything has a start and an end and, uh, and you have to look forward. And now I, uh, I look forward. I look forward to challenges because I feel that I'm in a, in a perfect place, perfect moment of my life with experience um, and with a lot to offer. So I think I, what I need to do is just simply look forward um, and feel privileged for the time I spent at a great club. I've, I've heard from Barcelona and from Madrid that you were approached at some point while you were at Arsenal. Uh, so I don't know if those are going to knock the doors again. But uh, they wanted you, didn't they? They wanted you as being part of their infrastructure to, uh, to uh, identify talent. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, 24 years. So I think you could say that, you know, I've, I've, I've been approached a lot by a lot of clubs uh, over, the, over those periods, over, the, over those years. Um, for one reason or for another, I didn't feel it was right. Um, and I stayed at Arsenal, as, you know, as people like Arsene and Steve Rowley before that and, and, and a lot of people involved with the club know. Um, uh, I, I didn't feel it was right at the time. Uh, to move to, to any of those clubs, you know. Um, so, um, obviously, the situation is, um, is different in the sense that now I'm a free agent and, uh, and I can listen to, uh, to those offers with a different outlook and a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So you'll be fine. That's what I mean. <laughs> More than fine. And I bet you've already got the, the, the offers. Uh, but first the rest, no? That's the plan. Yeah, I mean... You know, 24 years non-stop. Um, and I am one of those people that finds it very difficult to switch off. Uh, so I, I think, um, you know, I need to uh, take a step back, reflect, um, a little bit of family time, uh, and then I'm ready for, ne for a next challenge or, or another project. Because people think that it's, it's a very glamorous job you do. But I know that uh, there's a lot of traveling involved, hotels, uh, dinners on your own, etc., etc., etc. That uh, you know, it's it's yeah. It's what they don't yeah, see. It's, I I certainly wouldn't classify it as as glamorous, but I would say it's uh, very challenging and very rewarding. Um, on a personal note, you know, I'm I'm not speaking financially. I'm saying on a personal note, it's very very rewarding. And I again, I feel privileged to be able to have done the job I've done and to work. Uh, in an industry where I grew up and which I love, uh, but glamorous? No, I, I don't think. Uh, I don't think it's it can be uh, called glamorous in any way or form. Francis, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you for and uh, to spend all this time for the Pure Football Podcast. Uh, I'm sure uh, we cross paths many more times. Meanwhile, good luck. I'm glad that you are healthy and uh, and strong, and uh, and keep well. Thank you, Guillaume. It was a privilege. <laughs>